Hi everyone, welcome to the new episode of AI Makers Unpacked uh, series session and we have our guest today. Our guest of today is Anupam Gupta. Anupam Gupta is Vice President, uh, Global Optum Analytics at uh, UHG, United Health Group, and everyone is aware of United Health Group. It's a Fortune uh, 5 company, I would say, and top, I would say, marquee company. Now, interestingly, uh, Anupam carries a very long inning with UHG and we'll talk about some of the facets in terms of the professional journey. But let me talk about why this series and what are we trying to cover in this series as a kind of a, let's say, outline. Uh, AI Makers Unpacked series is a first ever attempt to what I call uh, delayer the professional journeys, the trial and tribulation, crest and trough of the top of the line AI analytics uh, leaders who are part of AI thought leader circle. And uh, whenever we talk about AI analytics, while it's a very interesting, it's a very glamorous uh, uh, theme or subject as we always call it, but really we get into uh, know what I call a sneak peek into uh, the AI analytics leaders because there is a phase facet dimension they've gone through in terms of what they have accomplished today and that's why uh, it's very worthy of them to kind of be there what they are doing. Uh, Anupam, uh, in fact, uh, as I mentioned, is a vice president and he's heading the global analytics team at UHG. Now specifically in his uh, 20 plus years of careers, uh, he has worked in DCS, he has worked in Inductus and EXL. And that's the inning he has played in the formative part of his career. Last 10 years, as I mentioned, last almost 10 years, he spent at UHG. And he's gone through various, I would say, uh, aspects, paradigms, and facets in terms of what he is uh, today at uh, uh, UHG. Anupam, welcome to AI Makers Unpacked series. Thank you, Samir. Thank you for having me here. I'm very excited about the conversation. Thank you. Great. Anupam, I think it's always said behind a great leader, while there is always a women, but there is also a great mystery. There is an intrigue. Uh, there is always a facet which many of the professionals don't know. Uh, help us demystify what Anupam Gupta as a leader is all about. It's <laughs> a good question. Well, uh, my leadership uh, philosophy or principles are actually pretty straightforward, Samir, and they have evolved over a period of time. So currently, uh, what I work towards is trying to be supportive towards my team and help them go and achieve what they would like to do and get out of their way. So I see myself more as an enabler to what the team is trying to achieve. And then I see my primary role as a leader or their manager is to make sure that I take hurdles away from them. You know, so uh, all of my team members or my leadership team are, are leaders in their own right. And uh, I think there's a very famous quote that you hire people who are better than you and then let them do their job and get out of their way essentially so that is something that i think has been working well for me uh, in the past three to four years uh, although prior to that uh, when i was more in a uh, when i had a smaller team size i was more managerial i'm talking eight nine years ago uh, my management style was actually uh, more I, I would call it i tend to get more into the nitty-gritty than details of everything that was going on and i, I wanted to control everything and I'm talking like a good eight or nine years ago. And interestingly, at that point in time, uh, I had gotten the feedback that, uh, you know, if you really try to control everything the way you do today, I mean, for the short term or with a smaller team, that is something that you'll be able to do. But that that doesn't bode well for you expanding your role. Or, you know, then how will you essentially do more if you try to control everything that, that's happening? And I, I thought that was really... That was feedback that that was transformational for me. It just completely changed my outlook towards how I saw my role going forward. And I would say that was, in a way, a, a turning point in my leadership journey. And I, I, I began working with more trust and, and more confidence in my team. And I let them do their own thing and gave them the confidence that even if something uh, did not work well, then I, I'm here and I'll be able to set it right. So. You know that's the that's the fundamental manner in which I uh, I lead my teams now. So that that's a very interesting facet, Anupam. You started, and I know, and I'm aware also that you lead a large team. What's the size of your team, if I may? Well, now it's about two thousand people. Two thousand. So that that's absolutely a very, I would say, massive size, if I call it an analytics AI 
data science side of the world, whichever nomenclature we use. Now, I, I and I want to double click in terms of this uh, facet of team management and yeah. take some of your nuggets uh, of experience over there. And let's rewind uh, and do a pullback in terms of last couple of years. Predominantly, all of us are operating in a virtual mode. Uh, COVID uh, has been, I would say, prevalent, but more importantly, the virtual working mechanism has also uh, unraveled a big change on the leadership style of each and every one. Yeah. Specifically, I'm in this massive team management virtually, when you would have started in this world of COVID, what changes in terms of your attributes you went through in terms of your leadership style or operating rhythm? Would you like to highlight that? Oh, yeah, of course. It was uh, personally for me, it was not easy. I'll tell you that. Uh, as a person, I like meeting up with people face to face. You know, that's my preferred mode of uh, communication. And that's how I connect with people. And that completely went out of the window. So I have teams all over the country, in fact, outside of the country as well. And on a regular basis, every quarter, I would travel and make sure that I would meet up with people and have face to face conversations. And I firmly believed uh, pre COVID that nothing really can be better than, you know, a face to face interaction. But all of, obviously, all of that was not possible. Uh, on the other hand, I felt very uncomfortable uh, turning the camera on. It was just not something I had done in the past during meetings. There was no need to do it. I, I yeah. personally felt uncomfortable with it. I just did not like it. And you won't believe me, but uh, for the first eight months after the uh, lockdown happened, I actually did not turn the camera on, on a single meeting. I never turned the camera on because I just felt so uncomfortable with it. And I thought that uh, this too shall pass and we'll all be back in our offices. And, you know, I kept waiting for the, the COVID Thing to end and I kept hoping that we'll be back in the office but obviously after seven eight or eight months it was clear that this thing is not going away so we have to adapt and uh, I obviously then I started turning my camera on for one on face to face conversations even in team meetings for that matter I still feel you know there's a part of me that still feels that this isn't nearly as effective as being there in person with a group of people. You know, you see yeah. each other's body language, you react to it better. For a one-to-one -one conversation, this might still work. You know, this can help. Like, I can see your expressions, I see you're nodding, you're listening to what I'm saying. So it still helps. But in my role, Samir, very frequently, I used to have like the top 200, 300 of my team members in the boardroom and, and I was addressing them. And, you know, uh, that energy of the room that you draw from, that energy of the entire room that tells you whether what you're saying is resonating with people or not, you just completely lose it on camera. Yeah. There could be 200 people with you on a Teams meeting with all of them turning their camera on. It doesn't matter. You can't see all of them. Did you, you know? also face Anupam? And that's, that's very uh, interestingly what you said, that look, in the first few months, you were not comfortable facing the camera and it just uh, was almost, you were almost compelled because this this got prolonged and you felt maybe this is what it is now with, with the things happening. But tell, tell me situations over there when some of your employees, some of your uh, team members, uh, I mean, when they had, and many of the people went through meltdowns, lot of, I would say, issues, challenges, how did you cope up in terms of managing that situations with your teams or a specific team member? Uh, the first few months were very confusing. Now, in an attempt to engage the team, I think a lot of companies did this, a lot of people did this, and it's something that I regret, actually. Uh, we try to engage the team by doing more. You know, let's, let's have, uh, you know, uh, online quizzes, let's have these Friday events and, and have pe people join in and... And then we realized that, one, nobody has help at home. They are already burdened by additional responsibilities. And then we are adding on top of that on their time in an attempt to engage them. That actually backfired a little bit. And we got a lot of uh, feedback saying that what we really need right now is more flexibility. We need you guys to try and give us some time back so that we can spend it taking care of our families because everything has changed. Yeah. You know? Uh, so we immediately pulled back. 
we immediately pulled back and we made a lot of these engagement efforts uh, purely on the basis of interest and we we stopped making it mandatory so you know if people wanted to join they could join in if they didn't want to join they could stay away right so we were doing these uh, virtual coffee sessions on fridays for an hour we we were doing quiz sessions and the attempt was that now we are not able to meet up we can't have parties you know like the way we used to have and these employee engagement sessions so we should try and engage them more only later i realized the mistake that we had made it was it was burdening the team and as a result of that uh, especially women who were then overburdened with the responsibilities of the household uh, you know with, with domestic helps not being there children not going to school it was particularly more difficult for women and uh, you know we immediately fixed that by essentially pulling back and and giving people the option to join or not join but even then by the end of 2020 we did have cases of uh, depression in the team we did have cases of people who uh, you know who absconded and essentially we got to know from their families that they were just not able to cope up with the pressure of it as an organization because we are a healthcare company so there are a lot of facilities available uh, like helplines uh, where people can call up if they're not feeling well and there's there's professional help that they can leverage and people do people did that we we uh, enhanced those efforts uh, one of the things that uh, i did personally differently and i also asked my leadership team to do differently was to start having more one on one conversations with people mm. not only direct teams but plus one plus two plus three kind of levels and just have a heart to heart conversation not necessarily make it about work but just ask people how are they doing yeah you know how are things going is there anything we can do differently for you would you like to take some time off uh, that's the other thing i'm sure this is also something that happened with everyone people were not taking time off because well they were all at home so they were like uh, anupam why should we take time off you know there is nothing to do and then we actually encouraged people to take downtime and just spend time with their families and and get recharged yeah and that helped right so it took 2020 was full of adjustments like this some that we had to make for the you yeah. know better one well, it's, it's you, you're right because a lot of these things i mean there is no template there is no playbook uh, which exists and uh many of these are what i call experimentations trials which you got to see and particularly i picked up one of the thing which you said where you stepped in and told your teams or the leaders down below that look have that one on one heart to heart conversation because yeah it's all about empathy it's all about kind of getting exactly. to what's feeling yeah yeah no. no that's good let, let me shift gears on a pavan uh, also in the continuum of ai analytics data science um, Well, the industry has changed. I mean, uh, you and me have spent uh, spent significant amount in this industry. It's changed. I mean, one of the uh, thing which has remained constant is we are always dealing with very high pedigreed, uh, highly educated kind of let's say folks uh, because this is a very knowledgeable kind of a area where too much of expertise around uh, I would say various facets are required. Second, uh, alongside managing a large team, when you have highly a high pedigreed high i would say educated workforce comes a lot of expectations yeah from each and every professionals and which is all related to what i call the quintessential performance evaluation performance assessment but more importantly it's about uh, the expectations how have you seen over the couple of last couple of years this whole uh, work performance expectations and how ai and analytics teams have reacted to that it's evolved and it's continuously evolving right so uh, even from a technology standpoint when we started out having a 2 terabyte sandbox to be able to build models used to be a big thing right now it's nothing yeah right? so one the expectation that people have in the kind of uh, tools and technologies that will be available to them has significantly increased you know everybody wants to work on petabytes and petabytes of data and and have exposure to cloud technologies and and really want everything to happen at the drop of a hat in addition to that uh, i think there's a much better understanding of what people want to do from an ai perspective i think just the amount of buzz that has been created just the amount of know how that students today have in terms of what 
artificial intelligence or analytics is, is far better than what it was even five years ago. Right. So even at the IITs or uh, even at the top D schools, when we go out and hire, and uh, I personally lead a lot of these uh, hiring expeditions. When I ask the question from students, that, what's your understanding of what is analytics? Till about five years or seven years ago, the answer that I used to get was, well, look for patterns of patterns in data and figure out insights, which is all fine. Yeah. Still very generic. The answers you get today are, are completely different. That just shows you that how much emphasis there has been, uh, not, not only from the educational institute's perspective, obviously the institutes themselves have developed courses which are teaching people, but the students themselves have made the effort to learn so much more now. So now people will talk about the difference between statistical models versus deep learning models. You know, where would you apply neural network technology versus a logistic regression model and the kind of exposure that they've had through Kaggle and through other competitions. So they are far more informed than they were uh, five, seven years ago. So the big difference in expectation that that has, uh, that, that has made is everybody knows that would, what good quality work looks like. You know, you can't, uh, they're very clear in terms of what good quality work looks like. Questions are extremely pointed. How much data are we talking about? You know, what yeah. kind of uh, infrastructure do we currently have that's supporting analytics? What kind of models are we building? How much of analytics happens on structured data versus unstructured data? What kind of analytics is happening on voice and image data as opposed to just, you know, structured data sets and so on and so forth. I mean, these kind of conversations were unheard of five or seven years ago. So you really have to be at the top of your game technologically, as well as from being able to make the right business impact to be able to continuously get top talent. Otherwise, people will move on to doing something more interesting. Right. So the quality of work that you offer as an analytics company or as an analytics organization has become far more important because people are a lot more uh, knowledgeable and there's there are so many companies that that are doing really good quality work in this space but tell me one thing you mentioned specifically about this entry level uh students who would like to get in uh and and you said about evolution from their side also to ask very smart kind of questions yeah uh everything remaining constant in terms of let's say you are interviewing them meeting them having conversation and will pick up some of these entry level folks in your team, everything remaining constant, what is that one or two attributes you believe can make a difference uh, to get hired? Yeah, no. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our, uh, you know, how we hire and what sure. particularly do I look for when I'm talking to uh, students just out of engineering or B-school campuses, right? And that'll uh, help you understand how we do it. Uh, we ask questions obviously related to their subject matter, to understand the depth of understanding. So how deep does a person understand their particular area of expertise? That we yeah. start with that. You know, academics is, is important, but to a certain extent. The next part is talking about problem solving skills. Mm -hmm. You know, that usually happens through puzzles, case scenarios. Yeah. And when we do that, we don't necessarily look for a person who is able to always solve the problem. You, you know, that's not necessarily important. What is important is I look for people who don't give up, who keep trying to solve. They'll ask me questions that, all right, this is where I've gotten to, you know, uh, am I missing something or is there something else that you can tell me? But they don't give up, you know. So uh, persistence, resilience is extremely important. Obviously, there has to be problem solving ability. But one thing, uh, Samir, in the world of analytics or AI that people don't talk a lot about is how important it is to be persistent to be able to take your solutions to deployment. Yeah. You know, building the solution is one part of the picture. Everybody's focused on building the solution. That's where the fun is. That's where the interesting stuff is happening. But to be able to work with the business and actually take your solutions into deployment such that they result in business impact is a completely different problem. And yeah. the skills that you need for that, communication, articulation, business domain know-how, collaboration, working with people, having the ability to be able to influence them. And, and all of that is important in addition to core technical skills. 
No, this is very absorbing, in fact. And I was just trying to also think through somewhere as a trivia, is it linked to how have you seen your professional journey uh, coming along? Yes. But I, 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 would, I, I would say unlayer that piece. How, how did you land up in this whole world of analytics? Was it by design, default? <clears throat> Give us some flavor around this. No, it couldn't have been in the, by design in 2003. Samir, so analytics as an industry was, I would say, in its very, very infancy. And, Absolutely. Uh, very nascent. Know, yeah. yeah, very nascent. And people and you know students like me coming out of colleges did not consider analytics as a career because it just did not exist. So I started with Tata Consultancy Services. And uh, I think it was by pure luck and accident that I got to learn SaaS in my first project. So mm -hmm. I got exposure to uh, statistical and analytical systems. And uh, even back then, I was uh, working on SaaS on a mainframe environment. And that might seem, because mainframe environment, OS390, is such a legacy, such an old technology. Yeah. And I was working on uh, on a completely brand new software called SaaS, running on an OS390 environment. So that is how I got to know and learn SaaS and got to know that statistical uh, tools and methods can be applied so easily using something like SaaS. Uh, <clears throat> so I was one of the very few people in TCS who actually knew SaaS in 2003, and that worked in my advantage. So you're almost talking about two decades before. Two, 20 years ago, yeah. 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 Uh, from there on, I got the opportunity to become a SaaS trainer in TCS, as I said, because very few people knew SaaS and I had completely learned it on my own, you know, because yeah. there was a, a big customer that needed somebody who knew SaaS. I, I, I said, I learned it and I cleared the interview and got the opportunity. I literally learned SaaS over a weekend, you know, at that point in time. And very quickly, I became a SaaS trainer at TCS and I started taking classes. I'm talking at the age of 24, 24 and a half. I was taking and, and teaching uh, up and coming engineers SaaS in data consultancy services. Now, uh, because I had that skill set, uh, the world of analytics in a way opened up for me, uh, you know, because a lot of analytics at that point in time was happening on SaaS. It was the preferred mode of uh, running analytics. So after about two and a half years at TCS, I interviewed with Inductis, which was an analytics, you know, a niche startup back then. I think I was the 15th or so team member to join their India team. Mm -hmm. and I made the cut. And that's where I got into really uh, heavy duty predictive analytics using SaaS for banking and credit card customers. And Inductis got acquired by EXL. I spent seven, seven and a half years there. Uh, doing that. So across TCS and Inductis, it was a decade in doing analytics for banking and insurance. Right. And then I moved over to United Health Group to set up their data science and analytics team here uh, in India and, and Puerto Rico, and Philippines and Ireland. And uh, that's how the journey really has been, uh, Samir. So Interesting. One of, what I'm, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was saying one of the things that a lot of people ask me that is that uh, what comes first? capability or opportunity. Hmm. From my own personal experience, as you can tell now, capability came first. I first learned SaaS and then the world of analytics opened up to me. And that's a firm belief that I have that for people who want to get into analytics, you can't wait now to learn programming or learn Python when you get assigned to a product. You'll have to first learn Python, learn statistics, and only then you can expect that this world will begin to open up to you. Absolutely. This capability versus opportunity, because specifically when you get that opportunity, if that capability is not manifested in your behavior and disposition, it's an opportunity well, I would say, floundered. Yes. Uh, great. I think I think that's where our, our audience will resonate in terms of how, because uh, you rightly mentioned, because careers are never a straight line. It's never a linear journey. And everyone goes through that hoops and curves. But what's coming out very clearly is a very strong foundation or that uh, emphasis what you laid in terms of uh, a getting a practitioner view on SaaS and then enabling that internalizing internalizing that in the organizations you worked in. Uh, specifically now uh, this whole aspect about AI analytics data science uh, has come a long way. Yeah. I mean, we talked about teams, we talked about capabilities, we talked about uh, uh, I would say, uh, how the projects have been built upon. 
and it's getting more strategic today. It's AI analytics is a boardroom discussion. Uh, but the fact associated, and I want to pick up some of your thoughts over there, the fact also is that on one side, you have this massive hype around AI analytics. And I use these two words in the same continuum. On the other side, there is a lot of that fluency, internalization, what senior leaders, boards, CXOs, uh, senior executives need to build to really understand what's the art of possible. In your own, your own view, what could be the some of the ways where this democratization of AI analytics can happen in, in a much more swift manner across industries? Yeah, well, great question. That was uh, one of the reasons I moved to a captive within United Health Group. I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a step back. While working in the third party space, whether it was T TCS or EXL, while we were building the model, we did not get a very clear picture of whether the models were actually being deployed or not. You know, right. the, was the business actually adopting the model or not? We, we built something, we moved on to the next project. In a company like ours, you know, once you're part of a captive setup, you're part of an organization, you work on the end-to-end -end process of not only building, but also then deploying and working with the business to then actually have the analytic work uh, for business impact. So you get first-hand view of what's happening in the business leader's mind. Yeah. The democratization of AI, to your point, has two components to it. One is for the business leaders to understand how AI or analytics can actually help create business impact for them. The how question. Uh, they don't really care about whether the model you're building is a deep learning model or a holistic regression model or it could be an Excel sheet for all they care about. It doesn't matter. What matters to them is will it be able to achieve the outcome? Yeah. That's part one. Part two of democratization is is it something that the business teams can do themselves or do they need to reach out to a specialized group of data scientists to be able to help them out in a service-based framework? Right. The first aspect has come a long way. Business leaders now understand to a very large extent what is the art of the possible, you know, what is doable, you know, what can natural language processing do, what can image analytics do, right? Maturity levels are different across different industries. There are certain industries where data has been available for a long time, which are more technology intensive, say banks, financial services, airlines, uh, where the maturity is, is much further ahead. There are other companies or the other industries, like even healthcare for that example, which is slightly laggy, you know, where uh, the maturity from an AI ML standpoint is, is not as high in some of the more data intensive industries, but largely everybody understands the art of the possible. I don't think that uh, that is lagging behind. It is the second aspect of whether a business user has the ability to leverage AIML themselves through low code, no code solutions or through productized solutions versus working with a team of data scientists who are still doing it in a service based manner, right? Through democratization of AI, Samir, in my opinion, will happen when AI and ML get embedded into business products, when people don't think about that they what they are using is an AI ML product. When you think when you when you talk to Alexa, for example, when you when you talk to Google Home, you don't think of Alexa as an AI ML product, do you? Right. Right. When when it's embedded as you rightly it's said, embedded. it's what enables it. When my when my mm. mom uh, tells Alexa that you know play Lata Mangeshkar songs, she does not think that she's leveraging an AI ML capability. All she thinks of is this is a fantastic product that can do what I want it to do. Now, that's true democratization using AI ML. So in my belief, the true democratization will happen when business products, when products that solve business problems will be enabled by AI ML being embedded in them and are really, you know, that's how I believe that businesses will, you know, be able to scale the use of AI ML for business impact. Awesome. Awesome. Shifting gears. I mean, there is also, and this is more for existing professionals in analytics, AI, data science. Uh, uh, there is often this debate around domain capability versus technical expertise. Yeah. What's your stand on this? I mean, what should be the weightage, or is one lopsided amongst another? What, what's your your view on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Whenever I'm presenting our capabilities to people and I tell them what we do, I always tell them that uh, 
the key to our success is that we have deep domain expertise and deep technical expertise. Uh, for an organization, for a team, it could be 20 people, it could be 50 people, it could be 100 people. As an organization, having both of these are important. Because if you just have technical expertise and you don't have domain, you'll not be able to talk to the business user sure. you know, in their language. If you just have domain and you don't have any technical expertise, you'll not be able to build any solution. So either of them are failures, right? So you need business domain to be able to make sure that the solution that you're building will actually solve a business problem. And you need technical skills to make sure you build a robust, scalable technical solution. Mm -hmm. right? However, as an individual, when you start your career, my recommendation is that for the first five to seven years of your career, mm -hmm. focus on the technology, focus on the hard skill. Mm -hmm. right? Because hard skills and technologies are uh, transferable. You can, if you're a very good data scientist with a very strong know-how of statistics and, and uh, programming, you can leverage the same skill in healthcare, you can leverage it in banking, in airline, in, in many, many different industries, in, in digital. As you grow in your career and as you've experimented through many different industries, choose the domain that really talks to you, that you're passionate about, and then build domain expertise in that area in, say, years 7 to 10 to 12 and then 15. So that eventually you have a very strong technological foundation from the beginning of your career that can last you for the next 15, 20 years, something that you can build on. And then you can build domain expertise in the area of your choice. Because to be able to build domain expertise, passion is important. Mm -hmm. You have to feel deeply about the domain in which you're operating for you to be able to then do justice to it, right? So then from an individual's perspective, Samir, I think in the first five to seven years, you have to be more technologically oriented and then build domain expertise later on once you have a clear view of which is the direction you want to go into. Awesome, awesome. Well, I think uh, in our personal life, we have all many regrets. I think uh, if I open up that discussion, each one of us will spend a couple of hours on the professional journey. Going back, do you have any regrets? Yeah. Uh... Or if, uh, let, let me alter this. If you got to correct something or really tweak or modify something, uh, what is that one thing you would like to kind of talk about? It's not about a regret or something that I would like to correct, but I think everybody in this industry at some point in time will have to make the call of whether they want to remain a hands-on technology individual contributor who's deep into code and, uh, you know, or get onto a more business-oriented role where they're an evangelist of AI and ML and they work with the business and actually run uh, the business of analytics. You know, I made a very conscious decision to uh, move from uh, being a hands-on programmer, a coder, a data scientist, to then start running AIML as a business within the organization and, and help work with the business to evangelize it, right? Yeah. And I think that choice has now become more uh, prominent in a lot of people. And I see a lot of people making the choice of staying hands-on and, and being closer to the actual uh, programming uh, aspect of AIML as opposed to becoming a more, you know, uh, generalist AIML leader. Uh, I was a very, uh, very passionate programmer and a hands-on person some years. So it was not an easy decision for me. And uh, I, I sometimes think that if I would have continued on a more uh, technology heavy path as compared to, you know, leading a team of 2000 people and being more of a business leader, would I have, uh, you know, had more job satisfaction or would I have preferred going down that path? And uh, I don't think I would have. But, you know, as I as I see people making those decisions today, uh, I just try to give them my perspective on and help them make that decision uh, as they go. Right. So, I mean, that's that's always going to be a very tough call for every uh, person who's deep in technology. And 10 years from now, how do you see this world of analytics AI evolving? We are all taking a punt. So yeah, I need that uh, from you. If you extrapolate the journey that we have seen over the past 20 years, as you said, you and I have been doing this for a long time. More and more uh, graphic user interface or uh, open source technologies are becoming available where 
data scientists don't necessarily have to do the grunt work of writing up algorithms from scratch. Right? Yeah. Companies like Google and, and the Facebooks of the world, they are uh, making, they're provisioning all of the key algorithms that they're building, whether it's for natural language processing or image processing for that matter. So what really will become or you know is going to continue to remain more and more important or a differentiator is how do you leverage these algorithms and not so much how do you build these algorithms? Mm. Because I think a lot of the building part is is going to get commoditized. It's all there. What's important is for you to be able to understand how do you use it to be able to make a difference? You know, what innovation can you drive with what's already out there? Do I anticipate my team or anybody for that matter building uh, an NLP algorithm today? Absolutely not. It's all out there. Why would you not leverage what's what's already available open source and then tweak it for your particular use case and, and go and build it, right? So I see that uh, it won't even take 10 years, Samir, to be honest with you. I think in the next four to five years, maybe lesser time, a lot of emphasis is going to be in evangelizing what's available in open source to be able to create it. Like how do you plug and play in a way? Mm -hmm. How do you build stuff from what's already available online rather than rather than writing code to be able to develop these things? That's been a Great. big change. Great. Rapid fire round, Anupam, as it implies absolutely crisp, succinct kind of viewpoint from you, or maybe words. If your team has to describe you, generically speaking, uh, in one word, what is that one word you believe would be? Supportive and customer-centric. Say that again? Supportive and customer-centric. Nice. And if one advice you need to give to your team in this whole amidst of pandemic in terms of being relevant and surviving in these, I would say, challenging times, what that would be? Stay relevant. Stay relevant. Great. One thing which you have to, and though I ask, but I, I need now this in a much more uh, crisp manner. One thing which you have to correct going back in terms of your 20 year careers, what is that one thing would be? Say that again, I didn't catch that. One thing which you'll have to correct in terms of your 20 year journey, what do you think would that be? None at all. Anything which you believe should be done today in analytics AI is not happening. What is that one word you believe? And this is. Again, generic. Focus more on outcomes than the technology itself. And any issues you have faced uh, juggling your professional and personal facets of life in this 20 years? Uh, it's taken a little bit of an adjustment to make sure that uh, you know when your workday ends <laughs> and, and not be available 24-7. And what is that one uh, piece of advice you want to give for, for the aspirants who are willing to look at AI analytics as a long sustaining career? Don't wait for the opportunity to strike. Build capability yourself and the opportunities will come. Awesome. Any last remarks from your side? This is a terrific industry to be in. I feel deeply fortunate and extremely lucky to be here. Uh, not only the industry in terms of analytics and AI, but also healthcare. Because you, on a day-to-day, -day, I see how technology is making a difference in the lives of people, how we are actually making people live healthier lives. And in, in your job, if you're able to leverage your passion for technology and making people live healthier lives, that's like the best of, of both worlds. So uh, I, I truly feel fortunate to be where I am. Wonderful. And this is where we say audience uh, and viewers uh, for the ones who will actually uh, be looking at this particular series. I think what eventually came out to me was a very hard to hard conversation with Anupam. And we go back in terms of discussing and interfacing on many of the topics, themes and subjects of relevancy. But uh, for the first time, I think I could actually extract what I call the deep inner mode of Anupam Gupta. And it's not easy because at the end of the day, we all are leaders who are wrapped up in our schedules and our meetings, work. But more importantly, I'm sure for the audience, they were able to really unravel. What does it take to kind of sustain, make yourself relevant in this uh, kind of heavy duty, high octane AI analytics kind of uh, industry, uh, which is very unique. 
Second, I'm sure audience were also able to pick up that career is not a straight line, it's a marathon. And what does it take to kind of also ensure that sustainability uh, always is there and it's not a fatigue out issues. And some of these uh, perspective, what you touched upon, Anupam, what's straight from your personal experience, anecdotes, which I'm sure audience can relate because at the end of the day, I keep on saying, irrespective of the democratization of AI analytics, this is a very unique industry. This is a very unique uh, segment. There are a lot of brilliant and I would say very, very, I would say great minds working in this industry and everyone is working to create something what I call uh, solving large, complex, unresolved problems. Thank you so much for your time, Anupam. This was great and absolutely very, very, I would say, revealing part of the conversation. Thank you for having me, Samir. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And this is Samir Dhanrajani, President Free AI, signing off AI Makers and Packs with Anupam Gupta. Thank you so much, Anupam. Thank you. Thank you very much.